Hello, good evening. First, I would like to, to thank um, all the organizers for inviting me to give you a brief overview of what's ongoing, is, what is going on in, in Alzheimer's disease. I have several. Um, it's an honor for me and also a great pleasure just to uh, uh, meet with good friends in Spain, with Agustin Ruiz, Lumer Cebuada, with, who will very helpful in the field of SPAID genetics. So, why is genetics so important for research? I think it can uh, go this. Um, I'm sorry, I cannot read the, the, the screen there. So uh, it's just to see uh, why genetic is so important for research. The first one is it's because, from my point of view, this is the most frequent question raised by families. Once they come to a diagnosis in their parents, they just say, what's my risk? Uh, is this hereditary, which is a usual term. Um, what we call heritability is the probability that you can get more than frequently uh, um, an Alzheimer's disease, and among the very rare studies, it seems to be very high for Alzheimer's disease between 60 and 80 persons, but very difficult to measure because it's come from um, uh, twin studies, and twin studies are very rare. The second point is that it's important to understand why some people are developing Alzheimer's disease more frequently than others. Uh, the first point is to understand by an agnostic way, as we will see in a few minutes, um, all the different molecular processes which are involved. As you know, what we know about Alzheimer's came from phenomenological studies, that is, looking at the brain and trying to explain what happened in the brain. There we are on a totally different basis, so a new molecular process could arise in that sense. If you have new molecular process, new answers, you can get potentially new molecular targets. The other point that genetic can bring, and uh, Merci bring it a little bit uh, in the front in a, a few minutes ago, it's about a better classification, a more accurate classification of, of patients, which is based on this molecular approach. And finally, uh, when treatments will be available, so we will be able to calculate the susceptibility of each individual. That is, is this person at risk? Does it deserve a treatment or not? But not for the moment. So just to give you an idea of what genes are, um, in general, people think that uh, something which is hereditary goes in the family with a high risk, uh, which is in fact what we call familial Alzheimer's disease, which is very rare, which has an early onset with usually one major gene striking, which has an autosomic dominant form that cases are found in each of the different generations. But very small impact in the populations and less than one to two percent of all the AD cases. Conversely, what we are working on is this, what we call the sporadic Alzheimer's disease, uh, which in fact is late onset, the most frequent, and for which we imagine that several genes explain this different susceptibility. It's just fit better with what we call family story in, in, the, in clinics. It has a high attributable fractions, that is, it explains a large number of cases, and it corresponds to about the vast majority of AD cases. And as you see, it comes from an interaction between gene and environments. In that form, genes are predominant. In that form, it's a mix between environment and gene. So, when working that in the very first time, it was uh, in the early 90s, uh, a clear discovery was made by John Hawley and his group about a mutation that appeared in the amyloid protein gene, which is at the basis uh, of the amyloid signal plaques. And they found mutations in these genes, and this was the basis of a long, long story with the amyloid cascades, suggesting that the initial elements appear uh, in this gene and then goes on until the dementia all along the life of the patients. But this fit perfectly with, in that fact, the family Alzheimer's disease. There are still a lot of questions about this amyloid cascade as a linear model, I mean, uh, in the general case of uh, patients. Then to reinforce this hypothesis, hypothesis of amyloid cascades appears obvious mutations, one from the group of um, uh, Peter St. George Hislops, the other one from the group from uh, um, uh, Jerry Schellenberg, which also converged to APP, so reinforcing the APP hypothesis. And that was all for a certain period of time. Then another event appeared, which was 
not in this familial form, but in the more sporadic forms, which was related to what is called APOE. APOE was known before as a risk factor for cardiovascular disease because it transports blood lipids and the different forms, which are about three, epsilon four, epsilon three, epsilon two, epsilon three being the basic, which is the most frequent in the population, show that epsilon four people had the higher myocardial infections. And roses and others just showed that this genes was also found in signal plaques. And when you look at the risk associated with this different LL, you see that epsilon four is a risk factor for Alzheimer's disease, and epsilon two, as the contrary, is a protective factor. During, um, until about the mid uh, 2000s, the mid of the, um, the first 10 years of this century, these were the only genes that were found to be associated to explain this genetic susceptibility. About 500 other genes have been published during that period, but none of them until now has been replicated. And the game changed completely when introducing new genomic techniques, which were based on very high throughput identification of mutations all over the genomes with this human genetic variation map and with the association of nanotechnology, which were able in one run to analyze not only one or two mutations as we did before, but thousands and thousands of mutations. With these tools, we could then cover the whole genomes. But to do this, as you understand, if we test thousands or millions of mutations, we need to have very, very large sample of populations to be sure uh, to detect elements. So that's what we call genome-wide association studies, where you check for mutation in 80 cases and compare that to controls. You just compared each, you make a little diagram and you see what is popping up in these comparisons and this for million and million of data. So what we have done is that different groups of very, very large number of laboratories joined together just to see if it was possible to identify new genes. Uh, we had a group which appeared in Europe, which is European Alzheimer's Disease Initiative, another one uh, chaired by UK, which is Gerard Initiatives, another one in the US, which is a charge initiative, another one which is ADGC. And you see here the number of individuals we need to recruit to be able to get signal in that very powerful techniques. And the idea at one moment was to join all these different studies to increase the statistical power and to compare 17,000 cases versus 46,000 controls. And we did that for seven million mutations in the genomes. That allowed us, and Merci, and when you find this in this sample, we call that an exploratory sample, you may have false positive. So the idea is to replicate your observation in another independent samples. You see, we have 70,000, 45,000. Then we need to test what we found in this sample in another one. And there, we had a large sample from Europe and a bit from US there, 24,000 individuals to reproduce that. So the total number of subjects we collected at that time was more than 8, 18,000 individuals. And that allowed to make a significant jump in the understanding of what is called genetic susceptibility this is a paper that Merce presented a few minutes ago. And uh, you see all the different genes that we obtain uh, with these 14 nations working together. So we get 23 positions that could explain part of this genetic susceptibility. Then it was a great jump and we could have uh, what we call polygenic scores and things like that. And we could classify all these genes according to different categories because they are not really identical. We have very rare genes that cause Mendelian disease. This is a gene I speak about in the very beginning of my talk, uh, which were associated with the amyloid cascade. We have all the other one we discovered with this high gap initiative, which is a common variant implicated in most common disease. And other very specific, which are just behind this, rare but very powerful, or rare but not very powerful, 
and only one which is out of the scope, which is very common and very powerful, which is APOE. This is a map of what we call the genetic of Alzheimer's disease today. The other interest of this is, as you see, we scan all the genomes. So we saw new associations with the disease which were not due to only testing an hypothesis. We were in an agnostic approach, no hypothesis, and see what happens and see if this is, if this is robust. And you see that a lot of other uh, uh, metabolic pathways appear in this linear amyloid cascade. Of course, we get the amyloid cascade, but also um, information on the immune response, regulation of the immune response, regulation of endocytosis, regulation of vesicle mediated transport, cholesterol transport, protein folding, and so on. A lot of new and other hypotheses which uh, were very interesting to dig and to understand precisely just to see the broad picture of the pathophysiology of Alzheimer's disease. But one question remains. If you add all the information brought by all these genes, you can explain only half of this genetic susceptibility. So the question is, what is there? What is the susceptibility we could not catch with this type of studies? This is a big question that arises in Alzheimer's, but also for diabetes, but also for cardiovascular disease. We have this part of unidentified genetic susceptibility. Several answers to this. Um, we can imagine that there are very, very rare variants, that is, mutations which are not frequent, occurring in a lot of different individuals, and for this, we need to increase the number of individuals to study. We may have also other points, just like uh, a, a lack of statistical power, a failure to identify true causal variants, Interaction with the environment, remember, uh, maybe a gene can express only if it's in the good conditions of environment or the bad conditions of environments. If you don't know this, you don't see these genes. And then the last point, which is very uh, trendy actually, which is about the epigenetic modifications. So we will not go through all of this, we'll just take the example of the contribution of rare variants. Following what we have done in IGAP, uh, we published a paper uh, last summer uh, about rare variants. And very interestingly, we found three new positions which are all implicated in the immune response of our brain against Alzheimer's. So this opened up a new pathway where we found about 151 genes, potentially known already, which were all related to the immune pathway. So this is clearly a new hypothesis which is actually worked all over the world and where because we have a lot of information in immunology, we have a lot of treatments where everybody is, a lot of teams are working on just to find new way to combat Alzheimer's disease. This is an example of what genetics can bring uh, to, to Alzheimer. Finally, finally, um, just to find this new, this missing irritability, we are using all the new technologies which are whole exome sequencing, that we are sequencing all the information which is contained in what we call the exome, and all the information which is contained in the genome, which we call whole genome sequencing. In Europe, we have several projects about that. We have ADES Europe, we have Peridase, we have EADIs, where we are working with, all together, just to collect the same number of individuals and to use this new technique. So that's the way we're actually thinking about how to understand this uh, hidden heritability. Um, another example of this, and I will focus on this, is the European Alzheimer's Disease Bank, a new European effort where we have a lot and a lot of uh, new teams, and for instance, uh, Spain is in that teams, 11 European countries where we try to recruit another uh, large number of subjects. Just to give you an idea of the sample size, we are actually recruiting 38,000 cases and 63,000 controls for AD, but also MCI, 10,000, and also, which is not shown on these slides, vascular dementia. So we increase our numbers of subjects by 70%. So what we expect is to find this new rare variance, to find more 
uh, to have more statistical power to find this missing irritability. So the perspective now for genomics, uh, we have clearly improved our understanding of the molecular process and opened new way in the understanding of this disease. Um, new potential uh, molecular targets are uh, on the road, actually, specifically in the immunological fields. The classification of our patients with all these different genes allow to do a polygenic score that allow to classify better the patient, for instance, in the clinical uh, trial. And uh, finally, uh, due to its predictive roles, we definitely imagine that genetics will have a major influence on prevention, presymptomatic and early diagnosis, and all this deserve, for the time being, careful discussions, at least for ethical considerations. Just to finish, a word to all the people who work in that. This is the people of my laboratory in France, when the association of a network of uh, laboratory I'm chairing in France, which is called Distals, and also all the different people in IGAP, there is there the team leaders, uh, that participate in that actions. And of course, a big thanks to all the clinicians who help us to recruit and make all that diagnosis, and to the families who accept to do this. Thank you for your attention.